Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran Seattle area saxophonist and flautist Mark Lewis. We caught up with him about his new project coming out on April 2nd, 2021, Naked Animals. He revisits a chapter from his own musical history that was originally recorded in 1990 with eight original compositions performed by Lewis's Dutch Quartet. We covered a lot of ground in this interview. Enjoy. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Joe Domino, Neon Jazz Radio in Kansas City. Oh, great, Kansas City. Well, let me turn off this metronome here. Okay. Practicing the flute. Okay, there we go. Right on. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well. How are you? Oh, man, I, I remember our conversation last time very well. It was, uh, it was so refreshing. I, I love talking to you. Well, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we have a, a little, little problem now with the, uh, with the uh, sustainability of our clubs. But I just heard today that some of the... Uh, Money uh, is going to uh, restaurants and things like that. So, yeah, that's that's good. That's going to be a separate bill. Who knows if the Republicans will pass it or not? You never know. Well, I, from what I understand, I heard the same thing that this bill is supposed to infuse a lot of money in it. You know, I mean, the people's will is going to win. People love music too much. It's the language that like comforts the human race, and I think it's going to win. Yeah, it is. You know, it's funny because it's funny you say that because I I was thinking. Um, it, it's kind of like the soul of humanity, and and I just heard something on the radio the other day. It was oh I don't know, twenty two year old musician or something talking about the soul of humanity. But it was like it wasn't important anymore. And I thought, wow, that's a big change. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but I'm sure that uh, it will regain its its stature as soon as as soon as enough people realize what's going on. You know. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, I, it's still in the stages. We're still in the stages of. Um, What's happening? Uh, around well, the show, but I can't see because I'm almost blind. So, oh, there we go. She just, came, Ron just came in. Say hello, Ron. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. 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 We're not so, on the interview. Okay. Okay. Or are we? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was. Okay. Yeah, I was, yeah. No, this is perfect, and I think that's kind of the part of this whole pandemic that we're going through. How have you been doing with? I mean, right now. This is one year, which is kind of weird to me. March 12th was when it all really started. Yeah. Uh, one year ago, you know. So how have you been doing? Well, it's, it's, I've had my ups and downs, but uh, I just keep it private, you know, unless I really can't take it anymore as far as the politics go because uh, of, of the stupidity. But, um, you know, that's, that's the one thing. I don't, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty laid back with most people. I let them say what they want. And... And I listen, and when I hear things that I know that I'm not going to be able to affect any any change uh, except uh, maybe arguing, then I'll just listen to them, and then I'll, you know I'll be polite, but I won't engage. But but when I when I hear things that are very based on ignorance, I guess I guess it just bothers me. It's it's, it's the thing that bothers me the most in in life, and so then I I get I get upset, and then. And then I'll bottle it up because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But I have a release valve because I, I live in an alley, so I just open my back door. And, and if, if something bothers me, I say, what in the hell is wrong with you people? Are you guys asleep? <laughs> and my neighborhood loves me. <laughs> and, right. I'll, I'll, and then I'll, I'll say what I think, and then I'll shut the door. <laughs> One time I got the police called on me on the 4th of July because I told people not to pay their taxes if they wanted to be completely patriotic. Uh, because we're based on democracy, I thought, and uh, we should know where every penny is going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's yeah. uh, any secret society is not democracy. A secret is not democracy. Yeah. And we have far too much secrecy in this country. Uh, it breeds, it just breeds corruption. It, it ha aren't you just blown away by all of the conspiratorial, absolute uh, lying that's gone on. I mean, I, 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 still, I feel like I'm in an alternate reality, man. Like, I think this well, last I figured it out. cycle, what's that? I figured it out yesterday. I was on the computer. I like to keep my eyesight going because uh, I had uh, congenital cataracts as a boy, so I was blind two years growing up as, as an infant until the last operation, and it took me a little while to see. But my brain has changed the compartments, so my sight... Uh, normally, your sight goes through uh, more, uh, uh, the frontal area, and uh, there's 60% uh, 
allocated for sight, and the rest then is for different functions of the brain. But but mine is reversed. So my 60%, I don't know where it goes to, hopefully music, but <laughs> some musicians <laughs> might say no. Um, but anyway, uh, it's reversed. And so I had to learn how to see through this channel. And it's a, a daunting experience sometimes because uh, I don't know if you've experienced when you walk into a room uh, it, through your ears when you hear things, you'll hear uh, a lot of noise at first, and then you'll pick things out one by one, bang, 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 and you know what they are. Well, when I walk into a room, I hear everything exactly as it is. Like when you walk into a room, you see things, and you could see everything at one time. I can't do that. I have to pick things out like you pick things out with your ears, and gradually I start to see what things are, and that's that. Picture taking photo photography helps me, so I thought I'd explain that uh, just in case people were wondering what the heck. I thought I was blind, but um, it keeps me going. And as my eyes get worse, I have to concentrate on my mental acuity uh, even more. But that's a good thing because it is it is uh, changeable uh, because of this, uh, so I can get it, make it better. And so that's what I do is just work. Like last night, I was working all night on on, on my photographs, changing the negatives into digital form. But in so doing, you know, I'm online a lot of times, and so I entered this group, which is a photo discussion group. But I really don't talk too much about things unless I write an essay about them. And so I noticed that I was in this photo little group that people were just having fun showing their photographs, and I was taking it so seriously, like, you know, well, I'm not sure if he meant uh, uh, that, uh, you know, if you say non-edited, I mean, every photograph is edited. You have to dial in the color, for instance. Uh, you know, and I just go on and on. And then she said, we're just trying to have fun here, you know. And I thought, whoa, that's interesting. That's that's funny. This thing sucked me in because, you know, the photographs and things, it applied to me. So I said, yeah. And then I started looking at it. And since I was online, my higher, my other instincts to uh, think about different things, you know, because your emotions are the things that tell you to think, really, uh, those, those disappeared because I was concentrating on the computer, which is, which is information coming directly into my brain, really. And I noticed that I, didn't, I wasn't aware that I was doing that. And when I'm in public or talking with people or even corresponding, but usually on the phone, for instance, like now, I'm in a different situation. I'm in a normal life situation. I have the sun on the phone because I walked outside. I thought, why not? It's a nice sunny day. And uh, I have people walking by that I have to not walk into because I like to walk around on the phone, you know. things. So I'm outside walking around, talking on the phone. And all these different inputs, the air, the temperature, these things contribute to my realizing that it's not the only thing. And so if this happens to everyone on the computer when they're on it to a degree or more, then they forget their objectivity because that's your reality, basically. And, and they think that their idea is the only thing, and they build upon that. And then if people contribute to that idea, in, and this whole like system that Facebook has made is very uh, much integrated into this, I think, uh, then it will start to change you into a one-sided pe person. And it's not really the people's fault. They don't even know what's happening to them. So within a year, it's getting bad or getting there. And then two years, because I've only been on the computer a relatively short time, so I'm looking at it as an objective person. I'm seeing what's happening. Uh, the reason is, is because I could never see it before. And, and finally, I, I arranged, made some glasses for myself and uh, out of real thick uh, uh, proper glass, not plastic, so that it's, it's much clearer. And, and these are very thick. They're probably half an inch thick. And I can actually see the computer if I'm about three inches away from it. And this has allowed me on a large screen to be able to see. So I can interact with people on the computer without having to use the blind computer, which is a pain. And it, and it has little things that come up, and you can read Braille and all that stuff. But I, I'm not good at that at all because, you know, I didn't expect it to be blind. That, that was the whole thing keep working and you'll never have to worry about your eyes, but they didn't know that these particular operations will give you uh, retinal detachments, which are far worse than cataracts, um, 
because it damages the retina, of course. So that's what I had too. So I've had six operations altogether. So I'm I'm struggling to be able to see. But anyway, that fact has isolated me from society in many ways uh, here because I live in an area which is uh, underdeveloped as far as population goes, and that is the Pacific Northwest, sorry to say, because it doesn't have the regional transit systems necessary for um, a person without a car to uh, interact in society in, in an equal and uh, uh, constructive way. So anyway, uh, saying that, um, you know, I'm here in this area, and I'm isolated already because of what I do and the fact that I don't drive. But when you're on the computer, you shouldn't be isolated, but actually you are, you're deceptively isolated because you can turn it off. You can't do that with life. It goes on. Whether you go to sleep, it goes on. Yeah. So that's, that's what I've noticed. And this is, this is tearing our country apart, and it will tear, tear the world apart if people don't realize what's happening. And you can, you can make algorithms uh, to try to get people to do this. You can, you can monitor their actions and say that they can't say this. But that's not the problem. You see, and it's the thinking that's the problem. We are not used to thinking anyway because we've been watching television for so long, myself included. Uh, but I was lucky because I had a bunch of hippies as teachers. They, the school opened up uh, when I was in sixth grade, and it, it was for, you know, they needed another school in this area because of the population growth. So they opened up a school, and who, who needed the work? Well, the hippies did because they had been to college and they hadn't, they didn't have a job yet. And the, so they had to cut, cut their hair and put on a suit and tie. And so these were my teachers and they were the, my seventh or my first teacher was a political activist and his name was Mr. Leakman. He got fired because he was teaching communism. And the reason he was teaching communism was not to teach communism. He just taught all the different ways that governments can work. And that just happened to be one of the systems. Well, that's how I uh, got, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, speaking to uh, when I was teaching high school kids <laughs> privately <laughs> uh, because I would give them four-hour lessons. And, and I, we'd, a lot of the lesson was um, music, of course, playing, and that takes time to play. But also... It was the things they weren't getting in school. Like I asked one of the uh, one of my best students uh, what what he was learning in school, and he told me. I said, "Well, didn't you learn this? Didn't you learn this?" He said, "No, no, we don't we don't learn that." So I, I taught him some things, and he ended up becoming a history teacher. And it was just a great feeling because he he put me as his his Eagle Scout. Uh, um, well, Eagle Scouts have things have a mentor, and so he put me as his mentor. I was very honored. For that, but um, he was a great kid and and very conscientious, and he wanted to learn these things. And so then another high school kid came that was in his class, and he wanted to learn this too. And he said, "Well, are we going to have long lessons like Joe?" And I said, "Yeah, why not? I mean, you know, as long as I can. But as long as you're playing, as long as you're practicing, you can have as long a lesson as as you practice for." So. The first lesson we did was eight hours long. <laughs> I charged him for one hour. I only charged for one hour because that's all these kids can afford, you know. So, and I, these are good kids, you know. They work for their for their money after school or whatever, and uh, they they just don't get. They don't expect to um, have money. That's a fallacy. It's like the generations have names attached to them and labels and how the people are, but you know. I've never met a generation yet that all the people are the same or act the same. There might be similarities. Like, my generation is the 70s when we graduated in high school. That's where they, or college is when they kind of figured it out. But I don't, you know, I mean, there was a lot of people in my time uh, I feel a bond with because we've gone through the same things. But I know that some of them uh, have one way of thinking and some have the other. The thing that unites you with generations, though, and that's a good thing and we need more u unity, is uh, the fact that we have gone through the same things and, and we were all the same age when we watched our parents uh, sh be shocked by the uh, assassination of Kennedy, for instance. Sorry, it still bothers me.
I yeah. don't know why. Yeah. It's just that that was a good man, you know. Yeah. And we need one right now. In fact, Joe um, Biden seems to be pretty good. Um, yeah. I just hope it's not good cop, good cop, bad cop, because you know, uh, you know, you, you never know. Well, but we'll hope for the best, and that's all you can do, is yeah. is take the information you have and always try to get more. Don't be satisfied with the information you have, even if you think it's right, because you have to prove to yourself. That's what I love about science, is that there's a uh, method which allows you to prove as much as you can prove in this life uh, things uh, uh, so you can rely on it. And then you can build and use those as building blocks where any lie or false information, uh, w well, we've seen what that does. <laughs> You know, yes, we have. <laughs> they don't build very well. They're not very good building blocks. They have a tendency to not be square, and they fall down, and they they're not they're not strong. You know, they have to cover for each other. It's not not that's not how you build a building. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I did want to ask you about is yes. naked animals. I mean, I am just always. So blown away by your music. Every time I put it in, I feel like I'm getting transported to a whole other auditory universe that's so appealing, and I want to listen to it over and over again. And when I do, it's like I pick these new things out each time. And it's Naked Animals, you're revisiting this. Talk to me a little bit about this project. Why now during a pandemic in 2021 was this the time to put this out? Well, some people think I'm an overthinker, but I don't. I I'd rather be an overthinker than an underthinker. But anyway, um, the Naked Animals was supposed to come out uh, when I was living in Holland. But whenever you uh, live in a foreign country, as uh, I'm sure many people from Mexico and South America and Central America can tell you, you are subject to uh, getting deported. And so I, I had won the Dutch government's uh, a blessing to, because I employed uh, three other people with my business but they have a rule that says that if I go home if I leave the country I will all my all my I don't know what you call it winning I guess you call it in in in, in court term I don't know there's something else a prize I, anyway award that's how they call it. All, all my award would be gone I'd have to start over and it was eight years of 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 gambling but I'm fairly certain that I could uh start over again and I could have won the case very fast if somebody would have explained to me how a social government works um, but nobody did because they figured that that's my job to learn that um, but I was coming from the United States so I didn't know about socialism and and what it says what the basic concept is is that everyone in the society has to have a certain amount of money and that money is either earned or partially earned, or it is given to you. But you have to have X amount of dollars. And so it came out to be, or guilders, so it came out to be 1,800 guilders for me, which was about $900 a month. It doesn't sound much now. But, um, you know, I was living for $25 a month when I first got there, uh, in a build, in, you know, renting a room, uh, because things were much cheaper. But uh, also... I rely on the goodwill of of most people, you know, who are renting to not gouge me too much. And this guy was a very good man. He ended up becoming part of Audio Daddio, which is uh, the record company we started. And his name was Pete Lalleman. He moved to um, Brazil. But he's in, in Brazil now, in fact. Um, but anyway, what, what happened to me is that I I started this company because... I got a, a well. First, I first I lost all my money because I got swindled on a, a trying to rent a, a place, and I did the first last month's rent, and it was five hundred guilders, and that's all that I had left. I'd only brought five hundred dollars, and I didn't have a ticket home, so I, I didn't know anybody in in that country. So I um, I had a phony rental contract, and and there's nothing I could do. The person was gone, the door was locked, and and I was a foreigner, so I got swindled. And I had to, I had borrowed 1250 because I knew one person in um, uh, Rotterdam and I knew one person in Amsterdam. And the one person I knew in Amsterdam 
um, had put me up a couple of nights because he heard me trying to practice the flute in his basement. I snuck in. I was so des- desperate to practice anywhere because I wasn't allowed to play on the streets or uh, pr- there was nowhere to practice in the hotel that I was staying in. So anyway, I snuck into the, this basement, and this was after I'd been kicked out of terrible places like garbage dumps and fish warehouses and any place I thought that uh, nobody would be. But I just was getting desperate, and uh, uh, then this guy came down to boom, 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 the stairs. Uh-oh, there's no way out. I didn't think about that. So he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I, I couldn't find, and I was really surprised to hear English. I said, I couldn't, I couldn't find a place to practice, so... I'm not stealing anything. I'm just practicing. He said, no, what I mean is come on upstairs. There's three more Italians up there, and we're all musicians. <laughs> so I ended up living <laughs> with them for a month. And then I finally got that place, but I got swindled. So I t- borrowed from this man 1250. It took the train down to the one person I, I knew who happened to be Noah Howard's uh, girlfriend. And she rented me a room on credit. And then Noah Howard was going to, due to be back from tour uh, in a few days. So she said, when he's back, then I will get you a gig with him, or you get you a gig with him. You have to play for him. But any, anyway, you're going to pay the money back. I, I know that. Uh, so uh, it was only 250 guilders, $125. So, um, so there you go. And that was really nice of her to do that. And so I met these great musicians, uh, Bobby Few and uh, Muhammad Ali and... Uh, his brother was Rashid Ali, and and anyway, well, probably still is if they're still alive. But um, I played with this band on the road, and and I was one little one white dot, you know, and it was all black band, and and I'd just been studying these people when I was going to Cornish it's a Institute over here for uh, music and dance and things, and it's, and so these New York free musicians were here in Europe playing, and I thought, wow, that's really nice. I was just playing all this stuff. In fact, I got kicked out of Cornish practice rooms because I was trying to practice John Coltrane, Interstellar Space, which was quite a, quite a, quite a cacophonous sound for most people, especially the secretaries that were trying to type two offices above, so I, I couldn't practice in, in the music ru- uh, department either, so I just have a hard time finding a place to practice, because, you know, that's what that was the cutting edge at that time, and and I wanted to pursue this because I'd had my jazz studies and great uh, teachers like Jim Wilkie. Actually, he did a program on NPR for quite a while. He still does one, uh, a local program, but he was my jazz history teacher. So I got a really nice education, and I was really astounded to find these musicians. The very some of them that I'd been studying. So I was on tour for about a month or so, and then I came back to Holland, and, and I said, well, I should have my own band, like Noah has his own band, and I had always had one in the United States, or tried to in college and whatnot, so I got together uh, with this book that was a jazz and, and improvised music in Nederland, which is all the different addresses and telephone numbers of the uh, jazz musicians in Holland. So I called up one by one, starting at the beginning, all the piano players, uh, to, and I found one that would want to do an audition with me because I auditioned them, uh, not to waste time. I didn't have any gigs. And I found this group after about seven different combinations or so. You know, you can't really say because it's taken one by one. But I did this group, and we made a re- recording, and then we, I borrowed the money for the recording, because I said, well, I'd, I'm going to make this recording to the different people I'd met at that time, and uh, I would like to, I'm going to send it to CBS Columbia when I get done with it, and maybe they'll uh, have me play for them, and then you'll get your investment back plus a certain percentage if you know, all goes well. If, if not, then I'll owe you the money, and then you'll get your investment back plus inflation. And uh, they liked that idea, so I was honest, and I did that, and Pete basically put in most of the money, uh, the guy that I was just telling you about that rented me the room, because he was very intrigued with jazz, and he, that was a whole new world for him, and he liked it. So I made this album, sent it to CBS. They liked it, and then they said, yes, we, we think you could play for us, but you need to change your music. And that's the wrong thing to say to a 20-year-old uh, musician, because he doesn't want to change his music. <laughs> and he's, he's not hungry enough yet, but I was pretty hungry. I... <laughs> the first week after they stole my money, I lived for a week on a loaf of bread 
and I, I rationed those things out, the, the, the slices. So by the end of the week, I was tasting every bit of grain in that bread. But it, it, I highly recommend it if, if anybody has any uh, ideas about maybe losing weight or something, because it helps. And bread, brown bread actually surprisingly has a lot of uh, nutrients the way the Dutch make it. But anyway, that's just a few parentheses there for you. Um, so anyway, I had the band together and... I noticed that they liked playing my music, so I said, let's just play all originals. And they liked that idea, too. The, and we played our first concert. Uh, it was just a trio, because that's all they could afford. And I'd already been playing in clubs by then, um, because I had a few friends I'd met, like Johnny Griffin and people um, involved in the jazz uh, that were coming over from New York. And uh, And I knew they were famous, but, you know, I didn't. It's a whole different world over there, you know. I, it's like you just hang out with them. Over here uh, in, in a club, the musicians, if they're very famous, they, they get away from you. They, they're kind of isolated a little bit. And that's because, you know, there's so much emphasis put on fame in this country that uh, we, try to, we tend to make them into something that they're not, uh, like some type, type of godly figure, um, which is fine for entertaining, but uh, for the musician trying to meet other musicians, it's not easy. And... It's different in the, on the East Coast as it is here, and Kansas City is much different too, which I like. Uh, but but many times uh, on on a large on a national scale, when you're playing, you don't get a chance to to meet the musicians here, so or the public. So as a result, um, I was really very happy to meet all these fine musicians like Des Dexter Gordon and, and my bass player James Long, and and they got me my first gigs because nobody wanted to hire me in Holland, um, and I found out later from James, who uh, happens to be black, uh, and he said, Mark, see, they're not used to, see, you're, you're the same color as they are, and even though it looks like there's no prejudice here, there's prejudice everywhere in the world, and, and you're just getting the reverse part of it, you see, because of all the things that have happened in the United States. So, and I said, but, but the Dutch were the ones that brought, brought them over here, the, the slaves, and, and he said, yeah, we know that, but... You know, history is selective, and, and our history is very selective. And, you know, he's a very wise man, James, and he helped me uh, getting through that because I was feeling really bad. Like, I just, two years, hardly any jobs, and working very hard and practicing eight, 12 hours a day sometimes because I was still doing the college practicing routine, and I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't have work, didn't know anybody. So I practiced, and... And I said, okay, I'm just going to keep practicing, James, and I'm going to get so good, I'm going to, I'm going to transcend the, the, the racial divide, and I'm going to transcend the whatever other prejudices they have, so that they will listen to the music and not anything else, and maybe they'll, they'll be touched by it, and then, then I'll do some good. And I don't know what, how, the, how they're going to be touched by it, but I have faith in music, that whatever happens when people listen to music, it will be a positive thing for them. Maybe they're, they were going to, uh, you know, have a business uh, a takeover that was going to cost a lot of people their jobs, and they knew it was morally incorrect, but they said, well, that's business, and they're listening to music, and they say, well, wait a minute here. You know, maybe people will be hurt. Maybe it'll open up their heart somehow, with, they don't even know, or their mind and say, maybe I should learn a little bit more before I uh, press that button, you know. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, so maybe I better learn a little bit more. And those types of things, I leave that up to the individual to learn. I can't teach anybody anything if I think I know it, because, number one, there's no authority there for all of the people in the world. But music, if, you, if it touches somebody, you don't have to have authority because they're the ones that do the work. They're the ones that open up their minds and see what the uh, immediate environment is for them and the reality of it and how it could manifest itself. And this is what music can do for many reasons. But that's why this group was, that group was formed. And so we went around Holland and actually I think we all, just Belgium and Holland. Um, and we played original music and this was the first album we did because we'd played, we'd already been together for more than 10 years, but we just wanted to put something down. And then I got deported, so to speak. I mean, I left, I told them I was leaving so they didn't have to deport me because they'd already broken into my house quite a few times just to harass me, the police. And, and then said, oh, I'm sorry, we, 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 it looked like a two on, on your passport. I guess it's a nine. You're, 
you know, things like that. <laughs> Just yeah. things I couldn't do anything about. And one time he got me, I was in, I was in bed, and I woke I woke up, and here's his smiling face. I got to know the the uh, the guy that came. The, they're called Frame. My mouth is kind of dry right now, but Framing a Polizzi. It's hard to say Dutch if you have a dry mouth. Um, <laughs> so the uh, policeman and I got to be good friends, and when I told him, when I went up and tell him that I was going to have to leave, actually, actually, I told him that I had to go home because my grandfather had died, and that's why I did have to come here. I couldn't leave, let my family go through that because he was a pa- kind of a patriarch, and, and I was very close to him, so it was very important. I did that, but um, he said when I told him the news that I had to leave the country, he's got a big smile on his face. He said, ah, I win again. You know, I I will miss you. And I said, what? I thought you were my arch enemy. He said, yes, your arch enemy like Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes. You're the only one I have. And I thought, wow, that's pretty that's pretty nice, you know. Yeah. That's a great compliment, for, especially from a policeman. And uh, from there, you know, and not that I have anything against him, but, um, you know, I've been battling them all my life, uh, trying to stay out of jail just for just for living and, and playing my saxophone uh, in different countries and whatnot. And um, and uh, recently, I, you know, I had the problem where they, they beat me uh, when I was walking home uh, for no reason and, and then made up a bunch of charges, which they changed three times. That was not easy. But uh, when, when, when I live a half a block away from the police department, and, you know, I was having bad dreams for a while, and, and it's very strange because only a few policemen can... Uh, make people psychologically changed, and and I've been mugged 17 times. I've never had any bad dreams about that ever, uh, but I've always dealt with it firsthand. I mean, I was never afraid because I thought to myself, I grew up around dogs, and my mother was a breeder uh, for Samoyeds, a top breeder actually, and won a lot of stuff. But uh, she said the worst thing you can do uh, around a dog is to be afraid, and so I said, oh. And I treat I treated people like that, and I was never afraid. The first time in Rotterdam I got mugged, I had five people around me with a gun in my chest and knives. I could feel the knives poking me, and and I said, and he asked me all the different things that I had. Like first he said, "Give me your money." I said, "Here's the money." He said, five guilders. That's it." I said, "Sorry, I'm a musician." He said, "Oh, that's what that is." I said, "Yeah, it's a flute." So he said, "Well, we can't take your flute." And I thought, oh, hmm, he can't take my flute. Well, that's a lot different than New York. And, uh, and I said, oh, thank you. So uh, they were getting ready to leave. And I said, that's all you have, Spider? I said, yeah. But here, and I, I, I said, I have this watch. I, I got this, and my mother had given it to me, but I thought to myself, well, you, know, you can buy another watch. And it wasn't engraved or anything. And uh, so I gave him this self-winding Weiler watch that, you know, it was a really nice watch. And I said, here, take this, but don't take it to steal. Take it as a gift. He said, what? I say, well, you're speaking English, so you must be a foreigner. He said, yeah, we're Moroccan. And, and I knew about the Moroccans. Uh, they, they were used, their, his parents were guest laborers, they called them. But now that the work is gone to rebuild Europe after the war, uh, they weren't needed anymore. So now there's growing, probably a lot now, growing and growing prejudice uh, from the Europeans because their culture is being lost. I see both sides. And uh, uh, so I said, oh, you're one of the wor- the workers' babies. And he, he looked at me and said, yeah. And I said, he said, you're not Dutch. I said, no, I'm not. Uh, and don't ever say, especially if you have a president which is not very diplomatic. Don't ever tell people you're American if you don't have to, if you're abroad. <laughs> because that can give, get you in big trouble. I, that's another story, but I won't tell you that. Anyway, so here's, here's the guy, and he has a, still has a gun in my chest, and I said, yeah, just take it, man. And I gave it to him, and uh, he took it. And then they ran off, and so then my knees started shaking. <laughs> I said, wow, <laughs> first time I was mugged. And so anyway, I, I I walked up the street, a long, long street, actually. It was right by the jail. That's funny. Um, now that I think back of where it was, because now I know the city. But I walked up the, the canal. It was actually a single. It's a canal with 
grass on both sides with trees and things. And it was a really nice walk. And I got to the street. I was going to turn to my house, and here's this guy running back up to me. Oh, I thought, oh, he changed his mind. He wants to have five dollars in the flute. Now I'm now I'm in trouble. And he, he he came up and he got close enough, and I he said, here. And he had tears in his eyes. He threw the watch in my hand. He says, we can't take anything from you. And he left. Mm. And that wow. just show what people are capable of, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I've I've used that every time, and and I. But when you have a systematic, uh, when you have a system which allows things to happen that are not in the order of uh, morals, or morality, which morality, in my opinion, is a logical and uh, uh, computable. Uh, um, uh, aspect of 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 living orga- organisms, and I think it, it would probably be very similar on many different other planes. If maybe using different materials or con- content, but the concept I think would be similar. Uh, if we'd ever meet an alien, but anyway, that's another story. Or maybe just an alien world, like some isolated tribe in in the middle of Mongolia that they've never seen. Uh, but I don't know. You know, this, this is what I'm thinking that if you if you give people the freedom to act correctly, then that's the first step. And if you oppress people by ha- having them do something that you want as, as, a, um, as a congressman or wh- whatever your goals are to manipulate society for uh, personal gain, then you're not doing that. And this is what's happened with our secret societies and 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 things that that stop democracy, uh, like um, like unfair practices, systematic approaches, like we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter. And musicians have been talking about this, white and black, because musicians never most most musicians. I've not met very very few musicians who have prejudice, who who not who are not against prejudice and that idea, um, because it's an old idea, and some ideas are fine. In the beginning, when uh, you're just an animal, because you know when you're an animal, if you don't know the other animal, and even if it's the same race, it might hurt you, and that's that's the first thing is fear. Fear is is the instinct that we that we we all have, and to use that on a society to get gains and, or to mask other things that are being done because of of corruption, which has, of course, happened all through any government. Now, I'm not saying that ours is the only one or the worst. I've just been saying that ours is not the only one, and it does have problems for many years, but it's been, it's get, been getting more and more oppressive as far as status quo goes, and the status quo that we think is happening is the one that is perpetuated on the radio and television. It doesn't matter if it's far right or far left, it's still the same thing. Uh, they're still talking about the wrong things right now, um, in my opinion, because if I can see in my uh, existence, just in my small point of view, which is wherever I happen to be playing my saxophone, uh, and that can be all around the world, but recently in the last 10 years, if I can see that um, there's a trend for the Earth to have temperature changes and global warming, then that means that it's pretty far along because the Earth is quite a large uh, body uh, compared to a man. And that's how we, that's how we measure things is, is in, in, in people units. You know, we, we can conceive in people units. We can't conceive 93 million miles away. Or uh, we can conceive that how fast light can travel in our domain, and, and it's instantaneous almost to man. Uh, we don't know the difference without a, a machine to measure it in our terms, but it takes eight and a half minutes to get the light from the sun to the earth. So that gives us a little perspective of how much we cannot conceive, and that's one of our closest and most uh, uh, apparent uh, objects that are uh, functional in our lives, the sun. And we don't know it. We can't conceive of it, really. We think we can, but when we get down to it, we can't. Just like we can't think of three or more things very easily at one time, uh, and 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 our intelligence is fairly limited. Uh, the fact that we can make machines uh, 
that have intelligence which look and sound like men uh, shows that it's not a real big thing. So people shouldn't get a, a big ego about how intelligent they are. And even though when I say I hate ignorance, I don't mean somebody that doesn't have, that's not bright. I don't mind anybody that's not bright. It doesn't matter to me. I, I don't want to judge that. But I do judge somebody that's not using a gift like the brain uh, to do more things than they are doing because that is um, detrimental to the entire race, not just the person, you see. Uh, and uh, ignorance breeds ignorance, and that's what we see today yeah. in, our, in our media, in fact. But what we have to do in this society, the first thing we have to do is clean house, and that means hold everyone, everyone, not just people that, that, want, that want to be... Uh, uh, put on, or that are put on a, a, a put in the spotlight because of some kind of, of gain that someone will have. No, we have to look at humanity's gain as a whole and put every one of us on a uh, uh, in in a transparent container so we can see what what they are doing, and then we have to hold them accountable to this. And it sounds rather draconian, but it's what's necessary. And the reason I say this is because when we, when and if we start to act, and, and, and we are trying to start to act, but we're not, the fact that Brazil is still burning down rainforests and doesn't care about uh, whether it spreads COVID-19 is, is one example. We're not, you know, if we were serious about it, we would make them stop. And if they didn't stop, we would use our war tools for that because um, it is ridiculous. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, we have got to first get our house in order to be able to be functional, to be able to clean up things like that. For instance, the Earth has done us a favor. It has put, it has swept up all the, not all, but a lot of the plastic that's hurting us and other things that that we eat or just the life of the ocean in general. And it's put it in one place. And people say, oh, it's so terrible. It's so terrible. There's a three-mile island of garbage. I say, that's great. And they look at me and say, what do you mean that's great? I say, well, can't you see that somebody's done the work for us? Why don't we get in there and get it out of there? Because nobody cares. Because we're too fragmented to be able to do that. Because we're dysfunctional because of the corruption. That's easy to see. Why doesn't, why doesn't somebody say it? Why doesn't the politician say this? Because they're just as corrupt because they have to play the game and they think that they have to. And, and so it just keeps going on and it will go on until we, uh, we all end up choking on uh, uh, not enough oxygen because that's what it is. It's all the other planets are not balanced very well for life. This planet was is balanced and the life that is on it is part of that balance. We are not part of the um, we don't have a right to think that we are independent of the earth because we come from the earth and this is what science tells us and it's science that I go by and I keep my religious thoughts uh, inside myself where they belong uh, so that I can understand God, if there is a God. And I tell God, I have to know. If I don't know, I will not tell other people there is one. And, and I pray, and I meditate, and I do all different things. But I can't tell you if there's a God, and I bet you the Pope can't tell you there's God either, 100%. I bet you. Uh, I don't think anybody can. And, and that to me, it gives me a little more insight than into uh, uh, what's going on. Because if you, if you have a war because of religion, that's really crazy. Um, you're not in reality. Reality is religion is there to help you. Religion is there uh, to give you guidelines uh, in case you uh, don't understand or are too confused. And if this does not happen, then to me, it is not m very godly. Um, but that's just my opinion. You see, I just play the music to get this point across. So this band was so close to what, in fact, it is still the closest band I know uh, and have played with. Um, and I love these guys, and they're still all alive. And I thought, well, since it didn't go out when it was supposed to, and I'd made another one, too, and I kept go go coming back to Holland to, um, because I wanted these things to come out, but the logistics were not there, and I, I had to, I had a, my wife was 
uh, we're not married anymore, but at that time, uh, she had been deported from the United States, so we had to live in Canada. And then I got deported from Canada. I tried to do it the proper way, but they, the different officials lied to us. So that's not a good thing. Um, that makes me not want to trust the government because a government agency lied and to me directly and caused my life to be uh, fragmented and uh, expensive, let's put it that way. Um, and then, uh, of course, by the time we got done with all that stuff and did exactly what they said, uh, we'd been apart for 14 months or something doing it because they told us we had to do this, and she, they said she had to go live in Holland, and I, and I had to wait for her here. That was not true either. Um, but they knew we didn't have a lawyer because... You know, otherwise they would have been hearing from our lawyer because <laughs> that's just what their normal practice was. And so uh, they didn't do anything unless there was a lawyer there. And that's what I was told later, and they lied. And I was told that later, too. Uh, of course, not on any documents or anything to, to my house so I could actually get reimbursed for my pain and suffering, if you want to call it that, but, um, or the money I'd lost. But that, that's the way it is. And, and I, I've, I've been going through governments for... Uh, dealing with governments around the world all my life. So the second album I did, no, the third, I guess, was called Border Crossing. And that had some of the people on, on it with the band, but I, hadn't, I didn't think I should make a, an album yet with that band because we were working and we were growing all the time, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to ruin it, you know? I didn't want to record it and then have it there because once you record something, people think that they know that's what you sound like. And even the band thinks like that. But it's not true. In my groups and in jazz, in general, uh, the, creative, the creative element is one of the most important things. Uh, authenticity is another important thing in jazz. And that's why uh, I give the Dutch the benefit of the doubt in the beginning, um, because they didn't want to accept me uh, because of my color. But... It, that's fine. Uh, it's not fine, but it, I understand why. It's because in jazz, one of the most important things is authenticity. But that doesn't mean authenticity uh, in this is what you have to be to be a jazz musician and you better uh, wear the right type of shoes. No, it means authenticity in music, validity in notes, in musicianship in playing the idiom or the music, in the history and knowing what it is and not just creating anything, uh, but actually uh, understanding it to the point where when you play music, you don't add music to the society, you add music to the body of jazz. That's what you're trying to do. So I know that my music is, um, is my own, but I also know that it is also everybody else who has played before me and maybe who's, who will play after me because it belongs to the body of jazz if I am lucky, if something happens where uh, I will be, uh, my music will be, well, how should I say it, valued enough to uh, save after I die and, and still live on. And that's what I'm trying to do because I've listened to it myself after I've recorded a composition or maybe written a composition and then I used to write one and then I'd record it and listen to it. And so when I built the studio here, I have a little recording studio. That I, I like to have one around me at all times, especially now because it's not expensive to have one. And uh, so I have my house set up like that. So the whole house is a studio. I just have to put a few things away so that it doesn't look too much like a house so that people can come in and not feel like, oh, there's a pair of dirty socks over there or something, you know. Uh, so it doesn't feel as, as lived in, and then they're more comfortable to record. And I'll tell you, a house has a great sound if you, if you know how to use it. And, um, and this house had a great sound. That's why I moved here is because of the sound of the house, not, not for any other reason. I didn't want to move, actually, but I was forced to move, so I had to. And I, the landlord said, well, I want you to move to this house. And I said, Okay, let's take a look at it. It was more expensive. But I said, well, it sounds good. She said, what? I said, it sounds good. Oh, she said, oh, so that's, she was German. So she thought, oh, it sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> but what I meant was it really, it sounded good <laughs> as far as the airwaves hitting <laughs> the walls going, you know, the reflections. 
And so when I got in there, I started, for three years, she heard me cutting and, you know, chop, uh, sawing stuff up and painting. I would be outside painting stuff. And she said, what are you doing in there? I said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. So, so one time she couldn't resist. She came in and looked around and saw what I was doing. And she didn't ask anymore, but uh, I knew I knew she'd come in and saw. She was afraid I was, because I'd asked her when I moved in, you don't mind if I cut a hole in the wall, do you? Uh, for the, um, for the, for the, um, for the sound, uh, I mean, for the window in, from the uh, control room into the main studio. She said, what? Cut a hole in the wall. I said, don't worry. I'll put it back like it was when I leave. She said, what? I said, yeah, I'll, my, you know, my family are not musicians. They're, they do other things, and they're drywallers, and, some, and they, one, guy, one nephew lays cement. And so it, if I want something done, I just have to ask them, and they'll come and do it. And she said, "No, no, you can't. You can't put a hole in the wall. Sorry. I just. What happens if I evict you?" I said, "Yeah, I guess you're right. You know." But we. She was a nice landlord. Um, I, I had her for many years. That she owned this building, and unfortunately, she died. But um, uh, she fixed this up from nothing. Uh, you know, a lot of people buy properties, and then they sell them at a higher value. They do very little work, and then they keep doing that, and then they're rich, very rich, if they if they keep doing that right. But she didn't do that. She and her friend, whom I knew as well, uh, and they were the only ones that accepted my rental application when I did have to have a place because uh, they came to this new idea that they should have rental, no, um, what is it called? Uh, credit scores. And I don't have a credit score. I don't want to have a credit score. I don't want to owe anybody anything because it's hard for me to make money uh, as a musician. It's just very difficult in this country, uh, and I don't teach. I I'm, I made a point of not teaching. I used to teach um, uh, when I had the other place, and this this house I did teach for a little while in. But I thought, oh well, now it's time to now it's time to perform because that's what I do, and that's what I decided to do, and uh, what I'm trained for. So so we did, and uh, one of my students, uh, Rhonda. Stewart, who's here now, uh, at the time she was my student on the flute, uh, she said, well, if you stay, because I was going to leave uh, and go, I didn't think that uh, it was easy to make a living here in this country, and I'd already worked a long time in Europe, and I'd played in the major cities here and lived in them too, and I had the connections that I, I could have being who I was in this country, so, so I thought I'd leave and maybe do some more teaching or something uh, in another country. And I've always been intrigued by other cultures. So, so uh, that's what I was going to do. And she said, no, no, stay here, and I'll manage you. And I said, oh, no, you don't want to do that. Uh-uh. I said, I yell at my managers. I'm very upset with my managers. I don't like my managers. I tell them to, you know what. And um, no, you don't want to be my manager because this is my life. This is everything that... It doesn't happen in my music, you will be blamed for, or at least you won't be uh, very happy uh, when I tell you about it over and over again. <laughs> and she said, I'll do it. And, and Rhonda is one of the most kindest, uh, m nicest persons I've ever met in my life. Uh, and she went through, I fired her seven times. And, uh, and then one month I said, to Rhonda, because I was still giving her lessons, I said, I don't have any gigs. She said, well, you fired me. I said, well, how do I know which time that I fired you that you, you accepted it? <laughs> she said, now you know. And I said, oh. So I said, oh, would you please work for me again? And she said, yeah, I will. I said, uh, but you, I'll try, you just do, do it the way you want to do it, you know, because she's, she's, she has her own way. Uh, you know, I have ice is the way you say it in Dutch. It doesn't come out right in English. It, stubborn is not the right word for it. Because uh, it, she's not tenacious, and she's, you know, she, if you say something, she might not tell you what she thinks. Uh, that, she's very quiet. Those are the worst kind. And, uh, and I said, yeah, she's very stubborn. But that's a good thing, because I need somebody like that that's not going to give up, because that's also a good part of it, the eigenwijs, you know your own way and and she has you know 
gone through thick and thin, and and I try not to yell at her too much. Um, but uh, you know, she knows how important it is to me. She knows that it's. I told her when I first had her do this. I said, "This is how it works in my life. I don't expect anybody to think that it is a model for their lives or the way to do it." It's just how I do it, and it's not going to change because I've invested too much time in it, and this is how it works. The first important thing is music for me. That is getting the music out there, playing it, uh, propagating it, and writing it. That's the first most important thing. The second most important thing is uh, me and my relationship with others and uh, making sure that no harm comes to the others that that I care about, family and things, and, of course, my own self. That's second. So I don't mind going a year without heat for music. I don't mind not eating for music. Uh, but somebody with me, uh, somebody that's going to help me, will say, oh, I've taken on this life, and you've got... I can't, I can't suffer just because you are. I said, so this is why I told her this. I said, if you're going to be involved in my affairs, you are now being involved in the most important thing. This is, you can't get married to somebody and have a stronger bond than this. This is the strongest bond I know uh, for me, not for anybody else, for me. And that's just how it is. And so I said, if you can accept that and the fact that it will really bother me when I'm not playing, um, then then you can. Then I, I would like to have you work with me, because it's a heavy thing to give all your contacts and life. Uh, that is, I don't know, um, opportunity, I guess, and and direction. It's it's that's heavy to give put it in somebody else's hands, because if I ask her to be my manager or agent, then I don't do it. Nobody else does it either. You can't have two. You know, they fight, so to speak. So, I don't know. That's, that's how Naked Animals came about. It was just, we were supposed to put out another album, and it didn't happen again. This was just like the last time when Donald J. Trump was elected, and, uh, and they were supposed to put it out, and then they postponed the album, postponed it, because, oh, well, we'll wait till after the elections. Then it was, he got elected. Oh, we can't put it out now. I said, what? Okay, postponed it. So, so I'm a couple of years behind as far as putting out albums, but I did plan to put the album out as soon as there was a, a space in my itinerary for putting out albums uh, for that. And since the, um, the we weren't concentrating on any type of uh, touring or performance any longer uh, at all, uh, that basically was on the road two times a year, many weeks a year, and, and, and gearing up for that. So that saved me from uh, feeling like I was, uh, I don't know, in a small town with nobody to talk to. Because, I, you know, I got back, and then it's a small town, and then you can rest there and then get ready for the next tour. So this was kind of hard for me because I had no stimulation, and I don't have a television. I just listen to the radio sometimes, can't really see the television. But... I tried to make Facebook and what I do on that little thing, that little platform, I'm important because I know that that touches some people. And I have, I don't know, 5,000 friends or something. So um, some people will see th things I do if they want to. And, and that, that I tr I've battled with for years. But unfortunately, um, Facebook has a lot of algorithms that they put in there for their own profits. And... Um, there's just not a lot of people. They don't want a, one person to have a lot of people seeing their work or posts uh, if they can help it because it's not good. That person gains too much power, and uh, it, it, it's not, somehow it's not good for them. I, I haven't really taken much time to figure that out, but uh, a lot of things are algorithmic, and I noticed that your posts are manipulated uh, and 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 propagated to different people at different times uh, for their own agenda, not for my own agenda, and that's too bad. Uh, and 
And the first thing, I used to play Happy Birthday for everybody on the saxophone that was their birthday. And when you have 5,000 5, friends, there's 15, 20 birthdays a day. So I did that. They they made it after a while that I it was not possible to be able to do that. Uh, it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't load up. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So, okay, they don't want me to do that. I don't know why, but that's fine. Now, of course, I could probably do that again with all the video. Everybody's at home now, or a lot of people are. But back then, yes, I couldn't do it. Um, so then I went to just taking pictures and writing something nice on there and making a personal thing for them. So then I'm, I have all these placards with happy birthday, and I put my little uh, marklewismusic.com at the bottom. So recently, they've stopped me from doing that because some computer has said that I'm a machine, a robot, and for the last four months I've been battling that. So I've been really nice to them, trying to you'll f fill out their little questionnaire. When do you have a problem uh, uh, with the fact that we don't f feel that your uh, content is socially acceptable? I said yes, I do. I was just trying to say happy birthday, and it, it was getting to the point where even I couldn't say happy birthday to my friends, my real friends that were not just Facebook friends, but real friends, and. I said, this, I had to call the guy up and say, I'm sorry. He said, why didn't you say happy, you know, you say, have, you do it, make nice things for everybody else, and, and you don't even say happy birthday to me. I said, Facebook wouldn't, allow, they wouldn't let me do it. They said, I was, you know, that I could appeal this decision that I have. And so it was starting to cause me some social un unrest. Some It was ruining my personal society. And so I just had, Next time I filled out one of the questionnaires, I said, I've said this over and over again uh, many times, and you've done nothing. So the next time that you see this from me, it will be from my lawyer. And bang, it works again, just fine. Wow. <laughs> it, it, it's sad. It, that is a sad thing. Because is that what we have to do in order to communicate to a large tech company? Is that, is that how? Yeah. Every one of yeah. us has to be brought to that level. That's not a good level. That's a terrible level to, to have to interact with people at. And they win in, in, at that level. The government can't even interact with them at that level. They'll win. They're, they're, they're more powerful than the government. They know it. You know? But hopefully, if we can just get people back into the spirit of things, like that guy. Uh, yeah. When I was four, you know, you just, I couldn't believe it. When I was a kid, we all loved John Kennedy because he, when we watched him on TV, it seemed like he loved us. And he, he made us want to do something good. That's how it felt to me as a child. And when he died, I never had anybody die before. And my mom fell to the ground and I said, what's wrong, mommy? Because I'd never seen my mom cry. She said, the president's been shot. And I couldn't believe it. I said, well, what's that? What do you mean? She said, he's assassinated. You know, he, he, oh, you don't know anything. She said, you, he died. He's, he's not alive anymore. And it really hit me, you know. I said, but mommy, you can't die. Nobody can die. It's just that you're not here anymore. And she said, what? I said, you're just not here anymore. But but he's not dead. Don't worry. I don't know where I got that from, but that's how I thought when I was, you know, as soon as I could think, and I was completely blind, uh, I figured stuff out when I they would open my eye. They opened up my eyes. Needle surgery is a long story. Don't need to hear about that. But um, there came a point where I actually saw something, and I looked out, and I saw the, image that the curtain and the street light had formed on the wall, on the other wall, and I was in the middle in my crib or bed or whatever it was, and, and I'd never seen anything like that. I've never seen anything, actually. <laughs> so, so I saw this, and I said, what? And I remember, so I must have been thinking cognitive thoughts before, that, before I could see, because seeing helps you... Uh, 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 realize things. Of course it does. That's, that's how we function most of the time, as for better or for worse. But when I saw this shadow that I 
my head was casting because it was between the two, the light and curtain and, and the wall, and it was projecting onto the wall. And when I moved, it moved. And first I was a little startled. I thought, what? And then I said, that's exactly like I'm moving. That's me. What? what? And I felt my head, and then my hand went up on the wall. And I said, and I figured out, I guess it was about two. I figured out that the light was over there, and I looked out the window, and I saw the light, and then, because I knew what the window was, because I'd fallen out of the window once before. I used to like to do stuff, because I didn't see, so I'd walk on the edge of my crib, or edge of the, um, uh, uh, the crib was hard, because, you know, but your feet are so small, then you, you can do it, actually. But I would do that to balance myself, because I, I was trying to walk. And maybe I was already walking by then, who knows. Um, so I fell out, out the window and landed in the flower bed, and I was gone for an hour or so. My mom was really upset, but she finally found me. I was asleep in the flower bed. It, it was cool down there, cool dirt, and it was a hot day. I must have been taking a nap. And anyway, so I knew about the window, and I knew there was stuff outside the window and all that. So, you know, that part I knew. And then I deduct, deducted that the light was hitting my head, and my head was stopping the light. And then I, I looked, when I looked at the light, I saw kind of around my eyes that it was lit up, that my, my skin was lit up. Somehow I saw that and I realized that it was, that I was stopping that light. So it was like a little thought experiment, or like a little experiment as, as a two year old, you know. And it, it, that, I don't know why I'm telling you that. <laughs> to tell you the truth, but it must have related. <laughs> but. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, that's, so that's, that's why, you know, the, the band, is on two albums actually. The next one is the Seven Angels, and that's a ballet to show what jazz does in music. And it's seven movements, and it has seven different styles of jazz. It starts out with just the bass player walking, and it corresponds to seven ballet dancers, which are dressed in skin tight leotards so that you can see every curve of their body because they shouldn't be ashamed of it. And um, it, they're going to be bathed in a different color light. See, you can you can divide the light into three uh, primary colors, but you can also divide light into four colors. They're not primary, but they will make all different colors as well. And so every one of the people in the quartet will have a, a lower light level put on them. And then when the oh, and then they'll correspond to the dancer. So the blue will be the bass, for instance, and the blue dancer. Okay, so the bass is going off playing a solo in the beginning. That's the only one playing to start off this ballet. And so this one dancer will appear on stage uh, corresponding choreograph to the movements of what the bass does. And then you'll see a visual display of how jazz interacts with each other and works. Because I got this idea from, from basketball. Because basketball is a lot like jazz. So then they'll be able to see who has the ball which is the soloist, and that will be the dancer. And the other ballet dancers will interact with this dancer in a similar way that the jazz group interacts with the soloist. And there will be improvisation, but yet there will still be certain rules that they'll be using and certain techniques that are known to ballet and other forms of dance. It, it's not going to be ballet per se, it will be, but it will be done with dancers that are of ballet level. And that's why I haven't done it yet. And that's one of the reasons I haven't put out these two albums yet either, is because I'm, I'm looking for a ballet company, but I want a good ballet company, hopefully well-known, because I believe that my music is of that level. And I don't want to just use any old ballet. This is the, this is the problem that jazz musicians make. Since our music is underappreciated, even though they're at a top level, they don't use the top people in the fields if they tend to do a third stream uh, like ballet and, and, and jazz, that's third stream you could say in a way it's amalgamating two different things that normally don't go together but they they try but society is not very kind on jazz musicians and they don't realize that the level of intelligence and also depth in feeling that one must have in order to be able to play jazz to a to the extent that it, someone might call it jazz, is enormous. And, and, and playing in a bar for drinkers that don't really listen half the time or that their conversation is more important than the music 
is really sad, and uh, it's it's too bad that this happens. Um, I am thankful for any gig I have, but I do know the difference between playing in Benaroya Hall or Davies Hall or anywhere, and and a, and and a bar. You know that's the that you have to watch out that you don't play the wrong thing, otherwise you might offend somebody. <laughs> because that's that's really what you have to worry about as a jazz musician. Um, if if you are getting paid, but if you're not getting paid, then you have to worry about trying to get paid. Okay, that's the first thing. But really, a jazz musician worries about jazz first or music first. Let's say he maybe doesn't want it. It's other people that call put all these labels on music. But um, that's the first concern is the music. And then... After the music, then uh, making it part of your life. So that's why I, I don't do anything else other than music. Is I mean, for money, is because I don't feel that it would be as much of a part of my life in a capitalist society because I'd be trying to make money, and it costs a lot of money to live here. Uh, it, it's, it's not right. This is one of the reasons I left. I mean, this is what I discovered when I left the country, um, is that the real estate market was just getting going again. It had different spurts in, a, in different times of, in our country, but this was a big thing. And it was uh, used, it was on the infomercials, and there were seminars. And so I went to one of these seminars because I had free food, and I was going to college, and I needed some food. Uh, they don't have meals at Cornish. You just have to eat out of a vending machine. I didn't have any money for that anyway. So I, I thought to do that. Um, oh, so did you? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, there's cars and things parking around me right now, so I have to watch out. Uh, what sure. I'm outside, you know, <laughs> so I have yeah, to watch yeah. out because I'm blind, so I, I don't really see everything. Um, the car just kind of nicks me a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, no, what was it? Well, anyway, so that's that's why I I have this group uh, is to get these get these things together, the ballet, to show people how jazz works, um, and using and the, and not putting it out because. I wasn't happy with the level of choreography, uh, choreography and uh, dancing that I was able to get um, at that time. So the Dutch have very good ballet companies and 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 things like that. So it's not 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 the fact that I was living in Holland. It's it's just the fact that everybody else was busy two or three years ahead of time. And uh, so I said, oh, I'll wait until I'll wait for the right time. Maybe it's the wrong time to put this out. And and this time came, and Ron said, well, this is not a good time to put out the album. We did an album with Ron Kobayashi in Los Angeles, uh, and that's a really nice album. And I thought, well, that's cool. We'll do, we did the one in New York, and now I play in Los Angeles, too, so I like a band down there uh, with Ron Kobayashi. And Baba Elefante is the bass player. He's the only electric bass player I've ever used on an album. And... Um, it's because he plays fretless and he, he really sounds great. It's just that's just how he sings is with the electric bass. And I heard that and I said, oh, it doesn't matter with him. So electric, that's cool. And he can make it sound like an acoustic too. Which yeah, when that album comes out, you you'll hear that. I hope. Um, but that album is and Steve Dixon's on drums. So this trio, I worked at the what was that the Lighthouse? Yeah, the Lighthouse uh, the, for for the first time. Uh, years ago, and so we came back every year, and and I do a Southwest tour, even though it's really hard because there's less and less places that can pay. Um, and the Blue Whale I heard just went down to in Los Angeles, so that's another one that doesn't exist. But but then we couldn't put it out, and I said, Oh, well that's fine with me. She said, What? I said, I have something. She said, yeah, I want you to record now. I said, no, 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 because I, I was a bit kind of depressed, you know. Yeah, who, would, who wouldn't be? And uh, and so I said, no, I'm not going to record anything. I have some recordings I want to put out, and I've been talking about them to her for years. She knew that it wasn't – I tried to put it out in 90 no, – when was it? 88. I think I had an album with – it was with Mark Levine, Larry Grenadier, and Eddie Moore, 
and Donald Bailey was on drums. We had two days of recording, so we had two different drummers. Anyway, um, that album was a nice album, and we got a lot of airplay. I think we was we placed it like 37 in, in the Billboard charts, which you know it's not number one, but it's something. And and they sold a lot of albums from that. It's called In the Spirit, and so I'd done that. But the company that then uh, Stan Getz died. He was he was in the company, and he he was the guy that I had auditioned for, and he, he became a friend. But when he died, the investors in the company wanted to pull out and sell the company, so they wanted their money, and uh, and that's how investors are, you know. So they got it, and he had to sell uh, Ted Joya, a very fine uh, producer uh, who produced a couple albums for me, and you might know him from writing. He's a writer, uh, but Ted. Yeah. Yeah, Ted had that company, and he sold it, and he did his best. He told me, he said, I'm going to try to make sure that that you, that you and I, because he's on the company too, we don't get screwed. And he took a year to sell, to try to sell that cup, uh, company, and he asked my opinion and told me about these things, because we were close friends after we started working together. But uh, he picked the wrong guy. He, he, you know, he was a smooth talker. And uh, he seemed like a real nice guy, and that's how con men are. And uh, he bought the company, and as soon as he bought it, he resold it to a, a ch Chinese firm or something. They sold 900,000 albums. I didn't get a dime from that. And I was getting good royalty checks in the beginning, and this was for mechanical royalties uh, from what I was used to, uh, $600 every three months, 700 every three months, you know, or, yeah, three months, there were quarters. And they'd give... And, the new people did books a little differently. Uh, they did books in the new business model. So every time they made $540, they would subtract $540 as their cost of business. And I said, I finally I got tired of it. And they also re made me renegotiate for a lower percentage as far as uh, uh, my royalties go. And it, w it went from point zero five to point zero two five. So, you know, we're not getting we weren't getting a lot of money, but that was a standard contract in those days. In fact I was doing I was doing well on that contract compared to other musicians. Uh but they re renegotiated it so now it was point zero no, I think it was point five and that was point zero two five. That's how that went. Yeah, so that's not so bad. And uh now I wasn't getting any royalties and there was nothing Ted could do so I didn't say anything to him. But they wanted to put out naked animals, and I said, fine. But they didn't want to put the cover out that I had on it. And the cover, if you look at the naked animals cover, there's Mark Lewis quartet in the middle of this group of four African stick painting musicians. As My friend who was my A&R man in the company um, did that painting for me, and it was a beautiful Thing. He was from South Africa, from Johannesburg. No, Cape Town. Oh, he'd kill me if I said Johannesburg. Anyway, he's from Cape Town. And um, so he was always filled with ideas. And so when I left, he gave me this beautiful painting. And I, I said, oh, I, got, I got the album cover for that, Naked Animals. And I said, I can't not put that on the cover. They said, no, you have to put this one on. This is what we've picked out for you. And I looked at it, and, you know, they have all, they have all the money. They... The, first, the other albums in that company, Quartet Records, all had fine art on the cover. So my first album had James Weeks' uh, painting of the saxophone player and the guy sitting in the chair. And that's a famous painting in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So that was really nice and very flattering to have that on the cover. So they wanted to do the same thing, keep in line with the company. And I looked at the painting, and it was a fine painting, but it was not the message I wanted because it was cows in the trough eating their food. And I said, no, that's not, that's not, it's an animal, but that's not what I meant by that. I meant that we're the naked animals. Uh, we're naked. We're the only ones that need to wear clothes. The other animals don't do that. And in so doing, we lose our honesty. But um, big business doesn't see creativity as anything but a loss most of the time, unless, unless you're obviously making money by that creativity. So uh, that's how they saw that. And they said, no, we're not going to put the album out then. And they didn't. And I had a contract with them for six years. And 
and I couldn't put the album out. So now that contract's over, and I can do with it what I want. So I'm I'm putting it out now. So I'll keep people uh, interested in Mark Lewis because <laughs> they forget. People forget, and people die, and they don't go to the clubs every week like they used to. Because I've always had a weekly gig, so that I can always continue to perform in front of people, thus honing my uh, ability to perform in front of people even more every time, every week. And then I go out and play on the road with different groups in every city, and that also helps because the main goal in my life is to further the music and to you know be a better musician, and that's, that's how I, I do this. And I, I decided to do this. Be- getting back to what I started to say, uh, it, it's the functional part of living in a capitalism. People say, I don't have any money. I don't have time to practice. I'm, and on the East Coast, they really don't have time to practice because I noticed that even in New Jersey, where we were staying the last time, not in New York, people had three jobs. And these are not people that were, wanted to be musicians. These are people just trying to pay their rent. And, and that's what it's all about is that the get-rich-quick scheme, just like the stock market, is the flaw in the use of money. Money was created. It's not natural. It isn't something that you just don't pick off a tree, as my dad would be more than happy to tell you, <laughs> or he would have been. And uh, it doesn't grow on trees, but it is not real. It is a product of man's mind and imagination. And in making it up, it does not mirror life, which unfortunately it looks like it does in many instances, and we think that it is real, and we treat it like that. And so as a result, we will let somebody die because they don't have enough money. Isn't that sad? And it's not real. It is a reflection of reality and a very, very weak reflection, and it's changing all the time because it is a very volatile situation. It flows like, uh, like water. And what has happened is that we have a system which didn't really plan itself out as well as it should have. So there are a lot of leaks in the pipes, and there are a lot of ways to make more money than you earn or you ever could earn by an honest wage or by uh, honest product because uh, we need uh, to, to realize that re- money is a representation of work and material. Uh, it is not something that can be played with because you can play with numbers. That's what the stock market does. It plays with time and numbers, um, and that is not healthy. It produces undue wealth for people who don't have the uh, ability to, to have that much power because since we do use money in this way, it also gives them an um, unwarranted amount of power. And they don't. They didn't earn that power. They don't have the wisdom or intelligence to have that power uh, in a society. Uh, the society that gives somebody that power would elect that person if it's a de- democracy, or they would uh, accept that person if it was a tribal situation, and that person was chosen somehow as the uh, the leader or uh, uh, representative of the tribe what is good for the tribe tribe or society. And see, this does not happen any longer because you can just concentrate on the numbers. I could do that too. I, I did it when I was really getting tired of being poor for a little while, and it works. And I, I didn't have the heart to do it, but I, I made a few dollars for a small investment and said, yeah, I can do this. Um, just listen to the news, and you can, you can make money. Um, by commodities and, and futures and things like this. But at that time, when I was co- cashing in my chips, so to speak, uh, my dad had lost his job. It was in the 80s. And the foundry he'd worked in for all of my life, um, he'd worked there for 30 years so that, thus far, uh, decided that it was more profitable to sell the parts that the foundry was made of and then just go on and make $80 million and let 350 workers just go like that, even though they were making a great profit because it was easier. And that's because the the new owner of the foundry decided that it was too much work to have a foundry, so he'll just sell it for a profit. 
and that was the son of the uh, owner of the foundry. So this is how things can work in the United States. Of course, as my dad also told me, life is not fair, but there are certain things which are just not right, and 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 when and there are so many things right now that are not right in our society that we can be busy with all those things, but we have been busy with them. This is the whole thing. It's only been the last, uh, uh, well, greater and greater since the 70s, uh, since Reagan. Say, I'm going to blame everything on Reagan, okay, because I don't like him. I don't like him because he's a smooth-talking con man, and he's hurt a lot of people around the world, including the Eastern Bloc uh, and the people in Europe, but that's beside the point. Uh, I don't like people that hurt other people, and... Uh, this person might have been elected, but he fooled people because uh, he's a snake. He was a snake, and he uh, and he will. I wish he would go down as a snake simply because the things that he's done to this country, the deregulation and the fact, uh, the direction he's pointed the other politicians in, is not government as we know it or a, a reflection of the people. And and if you'll notice now, they're calling themselves leaders. They are not my leader. They are my representative. They should, and if they're not representing me and the majority of the people around me, then they should be out. If we have made a law against uh, prejudice in our country, against uh, equal right uh, or to have equal rights in this country for women and men, if we've made those laws and we have, then we should hold them accountable to them. And if they are not accountable, they should be punished and dismissed period, and never again shall they be represent, representing us. That's how I think things should be done. And if we don't do this, it's, well, I'm seriously thinking about leaving this country because I don't want to be in the middle of it. It's not going to be pretty. There's too many people here. There's too much at stake, and when people get hungry enough and the food starts to run out, and it is, and the water, and it is, because they're not, they're not, can, they're not taking care of business. They're just putting money in their pockets. And it, this has got to stop. So I say the only way to continue is to stop everything right now and say, hold on. First, I, let's, let's see where all the money is going. Every penny of the money. And then we'll figure out what to do. Because we haven't done that yet. And... Every one of us should be able to have access to everything that all governments do in the world. And, and for the government, and we should also agree on a, um, a platform of humanity, of something which is moral and right, that is independent of anything else. And we should write that down and we should agree on it because it shouldn't be that hard. And, oh, if you have a country which has uh, religious ideas about uh, women have to wear something you know, like um, or if you have a country which says that you have to go to church on Sundays uh, and, and, and that's the way it goes and it interferes with this then sorry uh, we first have to get this in order uh, you can have everything else but if we don't get this in order, you won't be able to have a church to go in and have these ideas. Uh, the ideas have to be universal. They have to be for all people, not all people that believe that God is this way or all people that believe that there's no God or all the people that believe that uh, uh, there should, the rich should control because they have more money so th that they think they have more right to control. Um, no, it should be for every human being because that's what the earth does it it treats every human being the same uh, uh, and when you when you hurt the earth uh, every human being can hurt the earth too uh, but we're hurting ourselves because we're not we're not separate from the earth we are part of the earth we need its soil uh, to grow things to eat we need its it's light from the sun, but we don't need uh, a light that's not the sun uh, because it will hurt us, it will kill us, or it won't give us enough nourishment from its rays. We need the air to breathe. Uh, we, we can't go to Jup Jupiter and, or to, to Mars and, and breathe no atmosphere or, or last there from any time at all unless we have a, a way to bring some of the Earth to it. Uh, 
we are part of it whether we want to be part of it or not. We can't even have babies away from the earth. We can't procreate unless we are on the earth. That's been proven. They can't figure out how to uh, procreate in space yet. Well, at least to get an egg to fertilize, uh, they can't do that yet. And the reason is because you need a one uh, gravity represented as one, which would be the Earth. <laughs> that shows our arrogance. But uh, gravity has to be the same to be able to have this egg to be fertilized. It won't happen in space. And there's no shield for cosmic rays that we have been able to produce yet either uh, uh, to guard us against uh, knocking out uh, electrons and changing uh, the DNA with its nucleus uh, because of uh, decay. So, you know, it's, uh, isotopical de decay. Hi. So that's what we need in, in, our, um, in our society, I think, is, is if you're going to build a house, you have to know what, you have to put that foundation down and, and know what you're building on. You can't just build a house without any honesty and, and just build it anywhere and not know. Not knowing is, is dishonest. If you say that you know and you don't know, that's dishonest. We need complete honesty from our representatives, and we have to stop paying them so much money. Uh, it's ridiculous uh, that money and standard of living is a factor in whether they are run or not. Uh, that shouldn't be a factor. But then I start to sound too much like a communist for people, and I say to them, well, that's, that's one system that has uh, that in, you know, written into it, even the religious thing, but, but that's not what I am because I know man is not capable of that. Um, that's made for machines, and it's very hard. It's very, it can lead to a lot of complacency. But there must be a way. And when I was living in Holland in a social society, I realized, yes, that is a good thing. I didn't like it at first because I thought, oh, I have to pay all these taxes. And I did. I paid 51% taxes when I started to make some money with the company, which was unheard of in the United States, making money from a jazz label. But, yeah, I, I started to get some good people on there and made some money and booking tours and things for other people and back and forth between the United States. And, and so I finally was able to make a little something, and I did. And I had two offices, one in Seattle and one in, in Rotterdam, but the one in Seattle wasn't making any money because nobody, jazz didn't sell in the United States. And when you live in Europe, you think, oh, I've got to get back to the United States because that's where the jazz is happening. But when you get back, you realize, where is it happening now? And then you realize, oh, no, it's not happening anymore. Uh, that's the history of jazz. It was happening and in certain ways, but it's always going to look very pretty when somebody else is writing the story about it. Um, but one of my friends... I met over there Dexter Gordon, a uh, uh, fine musician. He, uh, he did an album, uh, not an album, but a movie called Round Midnight. And that's kind of like the feeling is the Paris, you know, you go there and, it's, yeah, I don't know, there's intrigue and, you you know, you're you're valued and 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 it's kind of, life is, is a mystery and it's fun and, and you never know what's going to happen. And then when you go back to New York, it's like you have to do this to do that, and you have to do this to do this, and you have to make the rent, and you have to do... It's a completely different thing, and everything's all square and angular and gray, and it's not, it's not made to be pretty to you. Well, it's, yeah, Manhattan's changed, of course. But, you know, basically where people live, and, and, the, and where I would have to live, it's not real pretty, or where I had to live. But, uh, but in Europe... The person is more important. The individual is as important as the society. And, and so they want you to feel good and happy when you're walking through the city because there'll be less crime if you're feeling happy. There'll be uh, more uh, good th creative thinking if you take a break now and then and don't overwork the people. And, and this is what I thought was happening in the United States when I left. But when I got back, I left in 1980 again, uh, first I went in 78, I was there 14 months, and then I left again in 80, uh, I, I produced a, an album for a singer named Linda Berry from New Orleans, her, her real name is Von Griffin, so we had her first album come out as Von Griffin, she was one of the three Berries for um, uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny Mercer, she was a backup group like Andrew's sisters, and, uh, and she was from New Orleans, so 
I got to know her, and she lived in Seattle, so I promised her I would, if I ever could, I would make sure that she was recorded. And so I came back and I recorded her, and then the, the elections were going on, and then it was, okay, if Ronald Reagan lives, or lives, if he, <laughs> if he lives, <laughs> if he wins the election, then I guess I'm going to go back to Europe, because, you know, it, that means that it's a representative of how people are thinking, and I'll fit in better over there, because... I was just learning how to be an adult. I was then I was 21 and I I had some a lot of people wanted me to produce albums for them after I'd done that and worked with the musicians in Seattle. There's a lot of fine musicians in Seattle and I really was torn but I I said, "Well, I really it's really hard for me to know. You know, I was living in ho- you know, downtown hotels, the old kind uh that they've taken away now." So I don't know where anybody would ever live if they wanted to go from city to city like I used to do. But I couldn't afford to do that now at all. Um, on tour, you know, I save up to go on tour because the motels are so expensive. Uh, we probably make less money than it costs to go on tour, but I have to do that, you know. And then I, I come back and, and, and play in the steady gigs and save the money again and then go out again. And that's what we do. Sometimes we might make a profit. I never ask. I just ask Rhonda, can we do it again? Or, yeah. That, the answer is always yes. And I said, we've made enough money. Yes, we've always made just enough money. And she does the books so well that, well, she has somebody to do them. But um, I know how much money we make, and I know that I'm not making a lot of money. So I'm always amazed that we've made it through again and we can do another tour. Uh, I don't know if... I wonder if she adds a little money. I just wonder about that woman sometimes, you know. Um, but I'm I've, I'm able to su- survive as a jazz musician making the money that we make just a little bit, and I get a little disability, so that helps uh, a bit. Uh, not much, but it helps, you know. Everything helps in the, in in a country where uh, you need so much money just to be. Uh, every little bit helps. This is uh, fundamental problem that's wrong with our society because when you get done with eight hours a day five days a week that's more than enough more than enough of contribution to a society for you to not have to worry about where you sleep and if if somebody's getting rich quick on you just for the the fact that you can that you have to live somewhere uh, then that's almost as bad as uh, ambulance ambulance chasers and 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 people that want to uh, Make money on 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 negative attributes of society, uh, taking advantage of of people that are suffering, uh, which is going on now. Of course, don't get me started on that. <laughs> yes, yeah. Mister, uh, I won't say any names. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Jeff. Uh, no, I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day we'll be on a first name basis. You never know. But um, yeah. <laughs> so that's my story. I don't know right on. Time. Yeah, it gets kind of hard. You know, it's hard not to. Pl- I was used to going out and playing at least twice a week, every week, yeah. every week. I, I, Christmas and uh, the holidays. I would practice before I'd go. I came back here to see my family. Uh, well, I came back here for an eye operation, and it happened to be close to my family. There was only five places that I could go to get my operation. I was living in New York at the time. And uh, one of them was Tacoma, Washington, so that's where I was born. My family lives close to here. So I, I'm i very close to my family. Uh, they love me, and I always hoped that I would do well and supported what I do. And now, of course, that I'm older, uh, I have a lot of nephews and nieces and people that, you know, I say, my, how you've grown, and, you know, things like that. And I say, I'm just saying that to give you a bad time, because I hated it when I was a kid, too. And and then, you know, I got the kids to play with, because, I don't know, I, I, I play with kids pretty easily. You know, I enjoy the, co- the company of children, probably because I don't have any. <laughs> yeah. That's what people say, yeah, well, you wait till you get some. And I say, well, I'm not going to have any, but I like to play with them. They're fun. You know, yeah. they get the ideas. They like to hear new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Charles Bukowski once said, we're born geniuses and buried idiots. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I love Bukowski. <laughs> he was quite a character, wasn't he? Oh, man. Yeah. You saw the yeah. movie Butterfly, too, right? 
Yeah, with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, I think he did a pretty good job. I I never met Bukowski, but I knew some people who knew him. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I always liked his work. I mean, I think that he he definitely was an original man. I mean, there was no doubt about it. He was a swaggering original cat for sure. He was, and 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 our society doesn't really allow much of that any longer, unless it has a certain. I don't know. People are jumping on these platforms. But for the wrong reasons, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's stirring up trouble. We don't need that, that right now. We need to say, make, look at, it's been done. These things have been done. It's just the the laws are in place that people are not doing them, whether it's oppression in any way. And, and I think that, I hope, in fact, uh, because one thing I've noticed traveling from, country to country and seeing different cultures cultures, and not really being a part of any culture now, uh, not feeling at home anywhere, uh, is that we, hmm, how, how should I say that, we, we, really, we really need to step out of our culture and see what is functional and not think that what we hear is the only thing. Because it's not, and physics, and that's another reason I wrote The Seven Angels, uh, the ballet, and it's all coming together at the right time. So I like to think it was divine intervention that forced me here, but of course it probably isn't. Um, but anyway, uh, The Seven Angels is the ballet I was telling you about, and and to me, I, everybody was concerned about the last chapter of the Bible. You know, this was years ago. Yeah, in the, I guess when I wrote the Seven Angels, the people I was around were talking about it. Not in Europe; they don't talk about stuff like that in Europe. They're, they don't really do religion there. But um, over here, and and I said, well, you know, I'm going to read that thing. So I I, I read it. And I the thought hit to me: well, these are these so-called angels are basically reactions. They're they're physical reactions. Every Action has an opposite, an equal and opposite reaction, first law of physics. That's what this is all about. It's, it's basically telling you that if you, if you don't respect the earth and just dump raw sewage into your lake, then you won't be able to drink that water, and the water will be cloudy, and people will be, be getting sick. And if you keep dumping all that stuff in the air then the sun's going to go away because there's going to, it's going to get all warm and, and it'll produce carbon dioxide and it'll be cloudy and then it'll be fires. and that's, That sounds... and I, It hit me, you know. That's, and now look what's happening. Uh, and, of course, it's religious fervor is kicking in, seeing what's going to happen, you're all going to hell. I say, no, we're not going to hell. I don't think anybody's going to hell. I don't think God would do that to us uh, if, there, if there's somebody there that you think is God. Um, but, you know... I don't believe in Santa Claus anymore, and maybe it's time to remember that you're responsible for your actions here, and 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 that should be very important. And also remember that the kings basically had their way with all the Bibles that you're going to be reading. I'm not trying to get people away from religion at all, but trying to say don't don't be mismanaged in your head by somebody because it's strong. Or there's a lot of people that think the same thing because uh, a lot of people can be wrong, and and history has proven that. So keep you know always look for God in your life. Always look. That's what I I do. Still I still always look for God, but I don't pretend that I can tell anybody else how to do that. I don't think that there's any way to do that. I think that there's a way to show morals for the good of all. And the freedom of the individual that's that's what you can do, but to be able to tell somebody something that you have to imagine that comes out of your ability to imagine that or to be conditioned by going to somebody else who imagines that uh, that to me doesn't seem truthful, and my family, my mother and father, and people I've met who I, I value, have always taught me to be truthful. Uh, even what, my, one of my best friends, and it happened to be one of the ruth, most ruthless, 
criminal. I'm not not really a ruthless criminal, but let's put it this way. He did some time. <laughs> he did some time. Uh, and I missed him for three years, you know, but, but he was, he taught me a lot of things. Uh, he loved jazz. I meet these people. I meet these characters, you know, and they say, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you what I did to this person, but, uh, you know, you're a good guy, man. You're a good guy. And I, I like you. You know, that's like, I meet these guys all the time because I love the music and they happen to be very nice people. A lot of times, uh, it's just that they might have made a choice which doesn't agree with the rest of our, of our choices, and and so they have to be let somebody has to let them know that you know so they end up in a certain places, and so that's how this guy was, and he was from South Chicago, you know. I met him when I was walking down the street, and he he said, one of the, I remember one of the great great things he said, you know, Mark, half the truth is still a lie, and that's how he had conducted his life, you know. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. And, and he said, it's, it, it's easier. And I said, yeah, I never, I don't lie. I try not to lie. But it made me review, because when you say things like that, oh, I don't lie. Well, no, you do lie. Everybody lies a little something. I don't know, maybe. But I can't, I can't say that without reviewing it at all times and trying to look at, what I say objectively, because I'm a living human being. I'm not somebody that is sitting there on a shelf in a recording that doesn't change. I'm a human being that tomorrow I will be. Com I could be completely different. I probably won't, but I could be. I don't know. And and we all know that if you get hit by a car, you'll be completely different. You know. So what I'm trying to say is that since I'm a living human being, I'm. I should be able to be fluent in my persona as far as expression, but I should also be fluent in accepting other ideas and empathies, uh, uh, feeling empathy towards other people so that I can interact both on the grand scale, which to me is actually I'm not as upset as I used to be because I've been harping on trying to I don't know, warn people or so. I don't know how to explain it, but just I, it bothers me to see inaction when action is needed for the minimal amount of suffering in humanity. That bothers me, and and I see it a lot. And and I I, I have logical or I don't know if it's rational, but it, let's put it this way: I understand what logic is, and and logic is what we need right now. If if nothing else, logic is what we need, and. If we use only logic, it will bring us to the same conclusion, and that is we have to agree to do something. We're not, we are, we're not doing anything. We're doing a little bits of a whole bunch of things, but we're really not doing anything except cleaning up and trying to get the country to be functional again uh, because it has been left. And it's not only uh, Donald Trump's fault. In fact, I don't want to blame him. It's all of this all of their faults. Anybody that has been serving the people, or at least under the pretext of serving this nation, it's all of their faults because they must have seen this. And it's, it, had, it should have been their problem if they decided to be a representative of the people. It should have been their main problem when they saw, um, but it wasn't because of the lack of responsibility that this uh, culture has has produced. And I think half of that is from uh, tactics used quite obviously in my eyes, but maybe it's just because I've traveled, like I started to say before, uh, scaring people. The things were, things have been said and done on a grand scale uh, by leaders, so-called leaders that they call themselves, uh, because they are, uh, they want a certain result and they use, they use fear as, as that, as the motivation or to, to manipulate people. And, and it's nothing new. That's what the Bible does. Jesus, well, it did for a while until Jesus came along. That's probably why they put him up, uh, strung him up is because, because he couldn't use fear anymore. You see, the, the, 
the Jewish faith doesn't have an afterlife. It's concerned with now, and God smites you. God is not nice. If you don't, if you don't do it right, God will come and smite you. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue comes this Jew, and he says, Believe in me, you can do anything, but if you believe in me, you shall go to heaven. And, and that didn't sit too well with the smiters, because what, they've just changed the whole model of the universe. And so I can see where uh, you would want to get rid of this guy. And he was talking about communism and sharing everything. You know, just basic ideas. Uh, but to them it looked like, you know, probably communism, because they probably didn't have a word for it, or maybe they had a different word. Uh, but they, they had had society for quite a while, and, and they were close to uh, the Hebrew, especially uh, to Sumerian and the first cultures of, of, of humanity, written cultures. And this is a heavy thing, because uh, when you write something down, especially on a stone tablet, you know, it's going to endure for a while, and it's hard to change that way of thinking. But one of the first, the reason I uh, poo-poo many religions, as some would say, <laughs> I like to use that word, is because uh, one of the first, one of the first things that was edged in, in stone was "Thou shalt not kill." Period. No, no, not thou shalt not kill unless the government tells you to go to war. No, thou shalt not kill, period. So if you can't even do that, don't talk to me about the Bible. Because that's what I stand for. I'm against all war, all war, every war. I think all war, I don't think there's many people that want war in this world. And I think that if you could have a democracy, which is now finally possible, a world democracy, by the way, then um, these things must be taken into consideration and you could poll the people and say, okay, if you could, by this one vote, yes, do you want war or not, change the world, then do it. Give us your vote. You must vote. Just tell us whether you want war or not in the world. And if you don't want it, then any war that starts, the rest of the world will stop. All the weapons must be taken and gone. All the uh, weapons, weapons which cause radiation and suffering from uh, not knowing what to do with must be taken and put in one place uh, before they contaminate the rest of the world. Because a lot of the world has been contaminated and is being contaminated by the residual radiation that the uh, the testing of, of the thermal nuclear device has wrought upon our world. Because the half-life of that uh, is 15,000 years. That's the, the, the shortest half-life of, of the isotopes that come from the bomb. Um, 15,000 years, and then it's half as deadly. So... We've re that's how come my eyes, I'm a direct result of the, uh, of the explosions. Uh, you know, 58 is when I was born, and, and this is when they were doing open-air uh, explosions. Just, they were just like kids with firecrackers. They just couldn't stop and e everywhere. They knew it was bad. They knew it was dangerous because they ended up going to the South Sea Islands and doing it, as remote as they thought they could find. That wasn't Russia. You know, Russia probably did in Siberia. But what, whoever explodes one of these devices has got to realize that that, that, that radiation is going to be around for 15,000 years and you cannot reverse it. We don't have the ability to reverse it. So every one of the bombs is slowly, slowly finding its way to a residual level of radiation. Right now, it, it was at uh, five uh, units. I have a Geiger counter. I live right next to the base two streets away uh, from the Navy base. So I, I have a guy who counter for my own benefit and my own peace of mind. And the residual radiation has gone from, it was five. I, I can't remember uh, how, how they, Rhonda knows how they, uh, it's not RADS, it's a certain unit that they use, but it's, it's used over time for radiation. And, and so I read about this uh, in their units uh, from the, Geiger counter I have, and now it's at 15. That's everywhere, everywhere. You can't find anything lower than 15. At least I haven't. 
and uh, and I asked somebody about 20 years ago, uh, who was a physicist, uh, what is the uh, residual radiation, the healthy residual radiation level for a human being, and he says it changes all the time. I said what? He says I don't know because. Every year, the government bring or you know the people that measure this and and give us our guidelines raise the level of radiation that a human being is supposed to have at the most. Uh, they raise that level because they can't lower it. That is, there's no way you can have a lower radiation level once it's here. It's here. I think that's our problem. In in the end. Uh, but global warming is, of course, the first thing that we have to worry about. But this will come into effect as the radiation gets higher and higher and higher and higher, and there's less land to live in. And see, we, this is what I mean by not taking responsibility for oneself. I was told all my life to take responsibility for myself, and I think most of my generation was, and I wonder when they stopped. Because these guys are older than I am, that are running the country right now. Well, some, well, they have been. I don't know. Maybe they're getting younger now because I'm getting older. But it doesn't seem like uh, it seems like people are trying to not take responsibility for themselves, which again is a lie. And this has got to, This is why we have to make something that says transparency, complete transparency, for all departments in the world. But we can start with our own country. Uh, but it really sh has to be worldwide because because people are afraid that we're going to become attacked by a, a country which has more uh, firepower than we do. Even though we haven't won a war in quite a while, I don't think uh, we've waged a lot of them. But uh, I, you know, when the war is made by people who want to sell arms and to uh, to erase their pilfering from the books when they can hide money. That's what wars are for, is to hide money. I've been around long enough to know that. And I haven't found a good war yet. Uh, any, any war in my lifetime that I've ever seen has not been successful. And, and they keep waging them like a bunch of imbecile children that don't know how to play properly, so they have to grab things and destroy things. And, and that's how they act to me. That's what they look like to me. And they, they're the, they're the monkeys that can't get their hands out of the jar because they won't unclench their fists because it's around a banana, and they'll sit there for the rest of their lives until they die of famine. That's what's happening here. People will not change. They'd re they're so used to comfort and not thinking and not taking responsibility that they're willing to die. And let other people die, which is even worse, in my opinion. And that's what's happening now. And I've written songs about this, and I have words to them. I wrote those in the 80s. And I sing them a lot to myself because I'm all alone in my room, a uh, little house here, and, and that's all I can do. I entertain myself, uh, and I sing my songs because one day I might be able to sing them or somebody else might be able to, and I won't be uh, ostracized. Um, you see, in the last few years, I have been ostracized for saying anything on stage politically. So I've kept my comments to myself. In fact, in uh, Tucson, I wasn't even allowed to play there because I was explaining a song about not having prejudice. It was one of, one of the things I'd written called Up To It. And my idea that wouldn't it be nice if we have to teach our grandchildren or if the grandchildren come across the word prejudice that they have to look it up, that wouldn't that be a nice day? So that's why I wrote that song. And I said that to the audience in Tucson, and the owner didn't like it. And so now I'm not allowed to play there anymore because I'm not allowed to mix politics with my music. Well, they don't understand much about jazz because... Jazz is politics in music. It was, and, and it was it was people defying politics and saying, "No, we don't. We don't think that we should be separated, black and white people. We'll just play together. We'll show you." 
and we have. And yet, on Jazz History Month, you never hear anything about jazz music, about what jazz has done to help people. Oh, they'll have a jazz month in, in October or some whatever they decide uh, this year, so that it can be negated yet again, and there's no funds for it. But, but Black History Month, I. Just because I'm not black doesn't mean that I, you know, that I don't that I don't understand what's happening and that I don't think that it's wrong if if there's oppression. You know, I believe that that, that uh, all people should be treated fairly, and uh, also I believe that all people have been treated unfairly at some time as well, and and many people have taken advantage of each other throughout time. And we've had these wars, and we've we've uh, we've genocided the uh, the Native American uh, so that we could take this land. Because how how can you discover something if there are people living on it? That's what I'd like to know. But that's another story. Um, but we we just don't even think in those terms. And until we get our thinking squared around, uh, we're going to be fighting until we die, and and being worried about our own comfort. And 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 believe me, it won't be comfortable uh, if if we don't have any action because it looks good on TV and it looks good if you write it down you can justify all the different things that you're doing in your life for uh, the job in 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 the political realm if you're a politician is what I'm talking about but but that's not gonna you can justify all you want that 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 you should have that all li- that all lives matter but um, or Black Lives Matter, whatever you're going to justify, but the Earth doesn't the Earth doesn't stop getting warmer just because you're concerned with something else at that time, uh, and it it could be a very valid thing. Like Black Lives Matter is very valid. Of course, I would I think that I've been trying to talk about this all my life. One of the reasons I try to get put people not prejudiced. For me, as a, a, a white person, because I'm, of course, the, the, I'm, I'm going to be, as the Dutch would say, the, the peace pole uh, for people, you know. Um, it's going to, I'm the scapegoat, and scapegoating in any way or form for anyone is wrong. Uh, even if the oppression has, hasn't come from them, to use them as a scapegoat is doing the exact same thing, and it will continue, and it will bring disharmony and and, and non-unification. And I can't read this thing up here that's over on my window that my friend Helena Powell's Paul's uh, daughter wrote, but it's a big poster uh, that she gave me. It was her last poster, uh, and uh, it's very old now, but I still have it on my window, my display window, uh, when you come into the studio, and Rhonda's going to read that to you so you can see w- what I think about scapegoating. There you go, Rhonda. See, read that. Oh, hi. This is the definition of a scapegoat according to the poster in Mark's a, window. It has a goat with a line. In. Yep. It says no scapegoating. Scapegoat, noun, an individual, group, or entity made to bear the blame and responsibility for the troubles and failures of another. Two, whipping boy, voiceless victim, disposable stranger, slang, fall guy. And uh, as a verb, to create a scapegoat, to become a scapegoat. Dehumanizing alienation leading to suffering and violence. Here's Mark. Thanks, Rhonda. Yeah, she, she, she was my eyes, you know. <laughs> she helps me see. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I believe in that, you know, because we're all humans. We have to get along and... And the main thing is we have to survive. Uh, and that's, it's not going to be comfortable to survive. That's the whole thing. And the sooner that we start to understand this, the less, the, the less suffering will, there will be, I think. I, that's, that's why I chose to be a musician. Because I knew, as a physicist, I was taking two majors and I still hadn't decided yet uh, in college. So when I got it, when I, I changed to go to music school then that made my that's why I went to the music school because I made the decision but really this, the decision was based on how much can I grow as an individual 
to be the best individual I know and fulfilling my life. And and that's a lot to ask, you know, from a high school ch- a child to decide uh, what he's going to do. But uh, when I wanted to do a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of things. But what are you going to do to make money is what they should say. And, and, and you know, my father was quick to point out that it's not the best way to make money to be a jazz musician because even then it wasn't. But you could still do it. And he said, it's going to be difficult, but we will we'll be on your side. We, we're not going to say that you made the wrong decision if you take that. Or you can you can go into the sciences or electronics. And, uh, and it was hard because I knew that I started out in electronics and even as a technician at $14,000 a year, and that was pretty good in those days. <laughs> $14,000 a year. Most people make that per month in these days. I mean, a lot of people do. I don't, but, you know, um, it's something. And, and, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, the university is really amazing. It's like a universe, you know. That university, it's so much stuff there. And I go from one class to another, and all these different subjects. I said, man, I could just live in this place. And there are people that do that. They just, they teach there and they, you know, they didn't want to leave. And I know how that felt. And I, I left after a year and a half because I decided that I was going to be a musician. That would be the most beneficial for me and I could do the most good. And the reason I didn't do science is because I said, I am not persuasive enough to be able to not have my science that maybe I discover something, be used for something that I don't believe in or that is wrong or that I think is hurting others. Uh, I, I don't have that much power as a 20-year-old or 18-year-old or whatever. And that's how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to work before I can gain that power. And many people don't ever gain that power in their lives to be able to have control on the work that they have done for somebody else. So I said, but music, I I might not have power on getting paid, but I will have power on what I create. And they won't be able to use it to hurt other people, hopefully. And so that's what made me want to be a musician. And I can still go to sleep at night and feel that I've done something. I, if, I, if I'm not kept up by my, my not doing enough part of my mind, <laughs> you know, but huh. at least I've tried and I'm, I'm still trying, you know, it's, it's a very strange thing to be isolated in your room because my house is just, it's not very big. I mean, I can fit a quartet in there and it's not easy, but I, I've manipulated the spaces and I can even go six feet apart from each other, but I don't think that would be very helpful if somebody had it in that house. I think everybody would get it. It's too small, you know. But I have something I can live in and rent, still rent, you know. Um, but a lot of people don't have that, and I was lucky because I saved. I was told to do that by a musician I, uh, that I respect, and he's just passed away, uh, two of them actually. They're, but they they were like brothers. Uh, Overton Berry and Art Fox, all those two People are from Houston, Texas, and one's a piano player and one's a tenor saxophone player, and they kind of took me under my under their wing in a way. We were colleagues, really, but I produced a couple albums for Art Foxall. Um, uh, There's another long story, but you, I probably told that to you last time as you were. I hate repeating myself because I'm getting older, so I don't know what I've said to whom. You know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hope it's not too boring. No, no, it's all good. No. I'm curious what, you know, I know you're missing live music. Everybody is missing live music. What do you hope that we collectively get from this absence of live music? What what do you hope sticks? What do you hope we appreciate or realize about not having it for a year? So It's hard to hear. For some reason, the phone has just gotten really uh, wavy. It's hard to understand you. Let Let me get this... Can you try that again? Maybe it'll be better yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. What okay. I want to know is, um, what do you hope we realize about this like year-long absence of live music? What do you hope we get when we return 
Oh, okay. Realize. After this uh, long intermission, I call it? Yeah. Uh, Rhonda thinks she's taping the interview, so what What do we? What do I hope will uh, come from this pandemic? What will pan out from this pandemic um, with music? Well, I don't... <laughs> You know, I don't. I don't mean to be negative because maybe I'm not seeing the entire bit. But number one, to be called non-essential in the first place is not a very good start. Um, but okay, I had to do a gig, which I went fairly well, as far as I'm concerned. I listened to it and watched it. And, and when I watched it back, it, I said, oh, that sounds, that sounds fine. That's good. Uh, but it was hard because it was playing on line, virtual concert. And jazz is not made for that. Jazz is not a music that you could just plug one musician into and then say, okay, well, I need a bass player and let's just use a bass player. No. When you when you have a group of individuals that you put together for jazz, you don't put together bass player, drums, piano, and sax if it's a quartet. You put together Bill, George, Harry, and 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 Junior. Uh, you know those are what you put together. You put together the individuals. Jazz is a personal music. It's na you're naked if you're doing it right. Uh, that's what I mean by authenticity. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be coming from the person. And it's not made to be listened to when you're not there. It's hard to explain it live. Uh, now, if you do it in a recording studio, we have developed certain things that make it sound good. We have things like processing and, and making the sound as beautiful as possible. And I love doing that as an engineer. It's one of my favorite things to do. But the, uh, the, the, the intrigue of somebody improvising something at that moment in front of you with the other people interacting with you, playing for you, is something you can't reproduce on a small computer or phone screen or even if you have a huge house with uh, big speakers and a huge television to watch it on, it's still not the same because they're not playing it for you. They're playing it for everybody. And that's good, too. And that's how I, I want everybody to listen to my music. In fact, I, I want to be out in space and and play for the entire world and have them all listen to the music. But, of course, the sound wouldn't get there. But, you know, that concept, that's the stage I want, is the world. But uh, it's not to make money. It is to play music for people. And I think that when I come back, if there's not anything allocated for that, there won't be any money for it. And it's already gotten to be... Uh, second class in a way as far as uh, if you tell somebody uh, that you're going to go listen to some jazz you know and ask if they want to come with you let's we'll see how easy that will be to get somebody to come with you to listen to it uh, because it is an art if it's done well it's an art and the person that partakes in art has to be part of it and put in effort in order to understand it you can look at a painting on the wall, but you have to put yourself into it and your own intelligence and heart to be able to see what it is. You have to put some effort into it. Yeah. If, you give, if you give a person that's never seen any paintings or, or reflections of themselves a mirror and show them what they look like, they won't know what that is. That's a, they'll say, that's a, that's a mirror. You say, no, that's you. That's a reflection of you. You see? See, that's you. See, when you, you move your eye, that, it moves too. No, that's a, that's a mirror. <laughs> that's what they'll say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> that's the funny thing about it. And, and they know. They haven't been conditioned out of that yet. 
They're trying to tell you something. But most people will not understand it. No, it is a mirror. No, that's a television set. No, that's money. They don't understand. It's not real. And that seems like, oh, of course they understand it's not real. No, they don't. They think it's real. They think it's real to the extent that if they don't partake in its reality, they will suffer. And they are willing to allow others to suffer because of that reality. And these are good people because they're able to turn the channel or turn it off because that's how it's gotten to be. Yeah. How's it going? Hey, man, this has been great. I really appreciate you taking this time. Now I get to talk to the Finger Show. Uh, good luck with the album. And, man, stay safe. I look forward to seeing the cat back on stage. Oh, good. Well, I want to tell you something about the Seven Angels. The last cut of the album, the last piece, it's yeah. one little piece of every one of the seven movements of the next album. So it's sure. part of them. So the last song, The Seven Angels, is one little piece of that ballet I was telling you about. Yeah. And so then when you listen to the next album, The Seven Angels, and I'll try to make sure that comes out soon, uh, you will know every one of the songs a little bit. Yeah, I will. I agree. <laughs> That's kind of funny, isn't it? it is. Thank you for, for your time and, and for helping me get my story out and I really appreciate it I'm glad you're in Kansas City it's a good city I love playing there thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in Seattle Kansas City and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz and thanks to Mark for his time music and cool if you want to hear more interviews go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com until next time enjoy the jazz my friends Neon Jazz.